Good afternoon, good evening, or wherever you're watching us from. It could be good morning, depending on what area of the world you're watching us from. I want to say thank you for joining us here on Black Doctor. This is our second annual Minority Health Summit. So this is Minority Health Summit 2023. And those many of you did not know, I oh, yes, see, we got somebody from Ghana. Thank you for joining us. So if you didn't know that April is Minority Health Month. And so last year we had our first annual Minority Health Summit. So this is our second annual Minority Health Summit where we're gonna be talking, we've got a series of panels today talking about those conditions and issues that are impacting people of color, uh, particularly in the United States, but around the world. And so we've got some great topics uh, for you today. We're gonna to be talking about asthma and allergies. We're kicking that off. We're gonna have some mental health sprinkled in there, uh, multiple myeloma, some weight loss stuff. And everything, oh, and also some sickle cells. So really a, a, a variety of panels here today for you. And so this is our first panel of five we have planned for you this evening. So buckle up, get you some water, get you some popcorn and pull up and enjoy this program. But the first panel, we wanted to start it off with a bang. We wanted to kick it off with our aces. You know, like, like you're playing baseball, you put your best pitcher out on opening day. These are these are coming with our, with our champions right now. So uh, the panel that we have for you today, we're going to be talking about breathing while black. That's asthma and allergies in the black community. And there was nobody that I would rather have on this panel with me other than the three top black doctor doctors. I, I'm just going to, you know, I'm, I'm putting it all the way out there. I am really, really talking them up so they, <laughs> so they don't have to do it. Well, before we let you know who they are and, and you'll know who exactly who they are before you do it a couple of things i need for you to do for me number one i need for you to let us know where you're watching from that is always important we like to know where people are watching us from all over the world and we see uh, my man zion jumped in from ghana and we've got columbus ohio so keep that coming in number two if you know somebody that needs this information please tag them or share this on your page we like to get this information out to as many people as possible so like this broadcast Share it on your page, tag a friend, let them know. And then finally, if you have any questions about what we're talking about on this panel or any of the other panels, always please, please, please drop a question in the comment section because you've got the top experts. We've got people that have even wrote, written a book about this. Okay, that's what we've got on this panel today. We've got the godfather of asthma and allergies, also known as Dr. Michael Lenore. We've got book writer uh, extraordinaire. She writes adult books, books for kids and everybody in between. And that's Dr. Renee. You know her as Ask Dr. Renee on her show here on blackdoctor.org Thursday night. And then we have my favorite pediatrician. You know, No shade to you, Dr. Lenore. We have my favorite pediatrician, and that is Dr. Samaya Brown yeah, uh, here in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm going to shout out before I dig up any hole this deeper than I already just dug it. So hello to you all and thank you for joining us this afternoon slash evening. Hello. He's already mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody. Thanks so much for having us, Alice. All right. So we already got some questions coming in. All right. So Dr. Oh. Lerno, we'll start with you. Uh, what is a good working definition of asthma? Um, well, asthma is defined as inflammatory disease of the lung, uh, characterized by certain things, bronchial constriction, uh, increased mucus abduction, smooth muscle contraction, but it's really an inflammatory disease of the lung. Okay, so how are Black people impacted by asthma? Well, I think, I think the statistics are pretty even in terms of incidence, uh, so that uh, they are impacted Pretty much the same way. There are just a number of ways that uh, asthma can be triggered. In fact, uh, and I'm sure our panelists will be engaged in a number of different types of asthma. Asthma is more a wastebasket term than it is a okay. specific medical term that we can work with because there's so many different types with so many, so many different uh, uh, prognoses and so many di different outcomes in different ways. So asthma is not one thing. It's a number of different subtypes of diseases. Okay, so the term, so, that, so this is my first time, we've done many of these programs, so this is my first time really, maybe not hearing it, but comprehending that it's more of a catch-all term. So it's, there's yeah. subtypes of, of asthma. Yeah, let me give you an example. First of all, there's asthma that, uh, an infantile type of asthma that 
where these infants will wheeze, especially those that have a history of RSV, uh, and they'll wheeze with infection, uh, and they don't wheeze when they don't have infection and don't benefit from treatment. Then there's allergic asthma, there's adult onset asthma, and there's an adult onset intractable asthma category. And finally, um, there are a number of things that we call reactive airway disease associated with other types of problems. So those are just some, uh, no, they're not so important to know the details, but just know that there's just so, uh, several different ways in which asthma presents and therefore kind of in kind a of quasi classification, certain types of asthma. So Dr. Brown, when somebody's bringing their child to you, uh, what are you listening for that, to, that would make you, or what do you hear that'll make you say, hey, this child potentially is suffering from a form of asthma? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. Um, and also for parents at home to know these kinds of things to look out for, right? Um, and so certainly a good history is really important to try to think about asthma. You know, more than 80% of children who are diagnosed with asthma will present with those symptoms under five but that's not 100%. So even older kids, you want to think about it in your differential. The most common symptoms that we hear about are certainly that wheezing, right? That coughing, that shortness of breath. They can complain of chest pain. They can complain of chest tightness, right? And these are kids. Sometimes they're not going to be able to tell you, you know, really exact exactly. Sometimes you notice that every time your kid goes out to play, right, that they are just not keeping up with the other kids. They get into this hacking, coughing fit. They've got to stop and, you know, come back inside and rest. So there are a number of other, you know, kind of symptoms that sometimes kids will present with besides coming in on exam and us listening and hearing wheezing, because sometimes you can't actually hear it with your ear, but we can hear it with the stethoscope, right? So, and also realizing that some kids have asthma and they don't wheeze, they have a cough variant asthma. And we also want to be careful about the differential. <laughs> right? So also everything's not asthma, right? So, you know, we want to think about is this acid reflux, right? So kids who are having that chest pain, sometimes they're also coughing at night, right? So thinking about that, is it seasonal allergy, allergies? Is it, you know, colds or a bacterial infection, um, pneumonias, those kinds of things. So we want to be really careful about the diagnosis. And certainly we will also use testing in kids where it's age appropriate in terms of spirometry, where they'll blow into a tube so we can see how, you know, good their airways are at getting that air out. Um, and certainly they can see, you know, pulmonary specialists that can do pulmonary function tests, those kinds of things. And also to testing their response to a bronchodilator or a medicine that's going to relax those muscles around that airway that's gotten tight to see if they actually respond to it. So, Dr. Lenore, um, are there some, some things like, is, is asthma one, is asthma hereditary? And if not, the, what are some of those things that could be contributing to uh, a child or someone or a person, even an adult, developing asthma? Well, I think there certainly are some genetic um, components to the process. Uh, and uh, obviously that um, becomes uh, one of the things we have to consider um, most often. Uh, many children, I don't remember the percentages, that have asthma uh, um, uh, actually do have uh, some genetic components, 60%. To 70%, I think, of those uh, who do have allergic asthma certainly do. And so I think that though, that's one of the reasons that, uh, that um, children do have asthma is on a genetic basis. Where it's most important to digress a bit is that in the treatment of asthma, some of the drugs that work for uh, other ethnic groups sometimes have a different impact on asthma because of the genetic components. And so when we think of asthma now, we, th we used to think of it as kind of more of a social determinant issue where, you know, mm -hmm. African-Americans, you know, living in poverty, dealing with other issues. But now we consider it another combo disease like so many uh, with some genetic uh, predispositions for the kinds of things that impact uh, things like racism and other things to give you a more clinical picture. So, so Dr. Renee, I, I know you know you you wrote some books and and about your own struggles 
with asthma as a child and, 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 and moving forward. So can you help kind of paint that picture and what really helped you and how the book, writing the book helped you help others on their asthma journey? So first of all, my mom is a respiratory therapist. So I was born to the right person. <laughs> um, so, and for those that don't know, respiratory is the system that the lungs are in. So it was really wonderful. And of course, she's also the person that I got asthma from. It is in her family. Um, so she was very well versed. <laughs> so <clears throat> I had a leg up kind of, but I actually grew up the first 10 years of my life wheezing just about every day. And it was, I would go to the hospital most day, most nights, October and April, because that's when the seasons changed in Michigan. And that's when I would get sick. But my mom would try and, you know, she would do everything she can. She had everything in the art, you know, we had everything at our house. But if it just got too bad, she was like, okay, we got to go to the hospital. And they never wanted me to go home because I was still wheezing. But she, because our doctor was amazing, may she rest in peace, Dr. Marva Morris. Dr. Lenore might know her. But she, um, she gave my mother her home phone number. And she was like, call me. If they don't let her go, I will talk to them and make them, you know. So my mom would call and she would say, okay. And so they, she would say, her mother's a respiratory therapist. That's her baseline wheezing. She can go home. And so mm -hmm. I would go home. And um, so my mom, because she was who she was, because she is who she is, she taught me everything I needed to know, which is why when I grew up, I knew I did not want to be a pulmonologist or go into allergy and immunology because I had learned a whole lot as a child because I always had to advocate for myself. And, you know, when my parents went around, my parents both worked. So I always had to talk and speak for myself. I carried a breathing machine nebulizer most of my childhood because I took treatments every four hours for a long time. So as a matter of fact, we went to the Janet Jackson concert and we had to take the breathing machine with us and we're going through the metal detectors. My sister and my mother went and me and my dad got stopped because what is this big thing she has? And, you know, basically, is it a bomb? <laughs> so, <laughs> my father's explaining and I'm trying to explain. I think I was like 12, maybe at the time. So we're trying to explain. They let us in with the machine. But when I got excited, I'd often have asthma attacks. So. Needless to say, my parents said we better take this breathing machine just in case something happens. Um, so yeah, I I thought that I would. Miss Jackson this. will get you excited. Miss Jackson will get you excited. So yes, I, I saw Michael too. Same thing. We had to take the treat the machine. Um, and then at one point, my asthma was really bad. I actually had a backpack and I carried oxygen, and so that was mm. interesting because I would go to the hairdresser and you know you had to tell everyone they can't smoke around me because. Yeah. But <laughs> so I wrote this book. Um, this is the first one I wrote, Mommy, I Can't Breathe, The Modern Guide to Navigate Allergies and Asthma, because I was in a bunch of Facebook groups with a bunch of parents. And I really felt like they were trying to raise their children in a bubble. And I was like, but that's not the world. So you can't right. raise them in this bubble. They have to be able to go out in the world because not everyone has food allergies like I do. And not everyone has asthma. So they have to be able to navigate. So I wrote that to help them because I knew that if they heard my story and how I've lived in all these different countries, I lived on an island for Pete's sake and I'm allergic to seafood and I can't smell seafood cooking without getting sick. So but I lived on an island in the Caribbean. So for me to be able to do that, I wanted the parents to understand, no, your kids can live a really great life. Just, you know, so I wrote my story in the beginning of the book and then the other half of the book. In our community, unfortunately, many of us do not know about pulmonologists and lovely doctors like Dr. Brown and Dr. Lenore, allergy and immunology physicians. And so they don't realize that there's a specialist that can help them. You know, I love all my friends that are pediatricians. I love my internal medicine friends. But there is a specialist that deals with this and they don't know that. And so I, I figured that out too and was like, well, if they knew that, then maybe they would know they need to ask the doctor. They need to go see this person. They didn't know about pulmonary function tests, allergy tests. You know, they just say we get bronchitis every year. I think that Dr. <laughs> Lenore and Dr. Brown could agree with me that most of those people don't necessarily get bronchitis every year. And so um, that's why I wrote this one. And then this one I wrote because there's a horrible epidemic as if we needed anything else, of children finding out that a kid in their class has a food allergy and they're throwing the food at the children, which what? could be very deadly yes. for many of us. Like I am allergic to eggs. I can touch a raw, you know, eggs on the outside, but once it's cracked, I have to immediately 
wash my hands as soon as I'm done. So if someone was to throw eggs at me and I, you know, was nowhere near any water or they held me down or something, I could die. And so I found out about that and actually I've heard horrible stories. And so I said, if we could get the kids at this age, this is a children's book, of course, if we could get them at this age to understand that everyone has something, some kids like Renee in the book is allergic, are allergic to food, then maybe they'll be friendlier and they'll be an advocate or an ally to help their friends. So they're not bullied and, you know, and then they won't grow up to be these horrible teenagers that were doing this. So, so that's why. <laughs> I, I think I just read that that book is banned in Florida. <laughs> and I, I think it is too, actually. <laughs> no shade. No shade on that one. <laughs> so, Dr. Lenore, you know, that was, that's a fantastic story, Dr. Renee. And, and it's the first time I've heard that, right? All of that. Like, as long as we've known each other, it's like, I okay, know. we're still learning about each other. So, so, but Dr. Lenore, you and I have talked about this before in terms of that emergency room visit when somebody, and, and sometimes Black people using that too much, too often with regards to the treatment of their child's asthma or their own asthma. They go to the emergency room and then they, they get over the crisis and then they don't follow up. And so um, when is the proper time to go to the emergency room if you're going to use it, if you're having a, a crisis event with, with, with your asthma? And then what you should, should you be doing to lessen or even eliminate those emergency room visits? Well, I think certainly it starts with an action plan that you, that you put together with your primary care doctor or your allergist so that you know uh, when to take a child to the emergency room. Every child is uh, somewhat different. Some children are very anxious. You have to take that into consideration. Some children are very sick. And so you should work out with the parents uh, kind of some parameters that they should use uh, before they go to the emergency room. I hesitate to be specific because parents are different, children are different. But I think if you work uh, the action plan um, before it happens, you can incorporate the unique style of the parent in that so that uh, at least you can intercede where you can really intercede. And I think the patient has some responsibility. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know how many times Dr. Brown or Dr. Renee have talked to people, worked out this beautiful action plan, and then the parent or the child or the adult didn't follow that plan. And so consequently, they waited until they were very sick uh, to go to the emergency room. And, they, and then they forgot your appointments. Now, what I've done to stop that, I know it, it may seem cruel and unusual, maybe somewhat unethical. Nobody can refill albuterol in my office but me. And the reason I do that is because I want to understand asthma control. So if you need an albuterol three days after I gave it to you, then I know your control is poor. I always tell the average person uh, uses one albuterol per year if they're well controlled. So I, I definitely, you could call me from Chicago, tell me which your grandmother was, you missed your appointment with me, then you got to go to the emergency room, spend six or seven unnecessary hours, put yourself or your child in danger. So I do think that, uh, and, and they have, so I do think that organizing an action plan, be that if your child re is, it, it doesn't respond to, uh, to, to a course of albuterol, or depending on the parent, but certainly have those parameters down and, and in, expecting some responsibility for the patient to take advantage of the plan that you worked out with, I think are two of the most important things. So, Create a plan, work your plan, follow your plan, be adherent to that plan. And, and that'll go a long way towards you kind of avoiding those crises where you have to go into the emergency room. I Dr. Have a Brown. I have asthma action plan in my book too. There it is. So you can get the book and now you got your action plan. Oh, yep, you got your plan. Ready to go, ready to made. So, so Dr. Brown, it, it, allergies seem like they're a little bit harder, right? Because asthma, you can say, I'm coughing, I'm wheezing, I'm, I have shortness of breath. But when you say allergies, it just kind of feels like it's a wait and see. And sometimes that could be a almost a deadly combination, wait and see if somebody has an allergy. So how, how, how should parents be able to wrap their mind around their child potentially having an allergy and how are they identified um, so we don't have a, a catastrophic situation like Dr. Renee uh, getting some raw egg you know, thrown in her face. 
Right. And I mean, definitely the wait and see is not the way to go. Right. Um, <laughs> so we're not just going to take kids and test them for everything in the world either, though. Right. We're going to take a really good history. We want you to know the signs of allergies. Um, and there is some new research that we want all communities to know about how, especially for food allergies, how to try to introduce some of these top allergens earlier in life to try to really reduce that reduction. It's one of the disparities specifically with our, in our community. And we as pediatricians have to do a better job of educating our families, right? So things like peanut, shellfish, fish, tree nut, these kinds of things should be introduced before kids, you know, get to their birthday. And you have to make sure that you're giving it in a safe formulation, right? We know that an actual peanut is a choke hazard, right, for babies, but you can do puffs, they make them in cereal, they make them in little powders, those kinds of things. So too, making sure that we're doing things to prevent them, right? And making sure when you're introducing new foods, right, your child is actually well, if they're already having vomiting, diarrhea, they've got a cold with a rash and a runny nose, it's not the time to introduce a new food, right? But if they've done well on their formula, you've started with a few of the basic foods that are less likely to induce those allergies, right? Like a, a cereal, right? Um, and, you know, a plain fruit apple, right? They're doing well. You can start every two, three days to introduce these new foods. But if they're getting hives, if they're getting a rash that like, you know, appears, you know, very shortly right after that, if they start coughing, they start wheezing, they have profuse vomiting, they have diarrhea, all of those potentially are signs. And older kids oftentimes will tell you they don't like the food because they don't like how it makes them feel. And with, of course, subsequent exposure, then you can lead to more severe reactions. So we don't want to wait and see. We don't want to continue to introduce it. And when we have those specific, that specific history, we can test you and see, are you allergic to egg? Is it egg yolk? Is it egg white? And then there are treatments. And this too, we need to get our community in these cl clinical trials in terms of treating, you know, allergies with oral immunotherapy so that kids may not have a severe um, allergic reaction. So there are definitely ways for us to test for allergies. And then too, we need to make sure that you have emergency treatment on hand every moment of the day. So having your EpiPen and especially those teenagers. <laughs> right? It's really hard to get those teens to make sure they have it every single day. Um, and teens, there's a new study that came out. I don't know if you guys saw it in the School of Public Health. Um, they saw that if you give kids a bank of money and they lose it every time you catch them without that EpiPen, right, then you can actually modify their behavior and it worked better than just education mm -hmm. alone, right? So we want to really educate know and be prepared if they have an allergic reaction. And, and while you're talking about this, I, I would like to just share a quick anecdote with you uh, so that black parents understand some of these treatments are available but you may never hear about them from your doctor or your allergist. I uh, sold my allergy practice about two or three years ago to a very famous uh, food allergy group. I mean, they, they had started some of the initial oral immunotherapy. So I, I was there for about six or eight months, and I looked around and I didn't see any, you know, we have uh, everything in Oakland is, quote, um, uh, technically diverse. But you know, we had mostly Asian patients, white patients, but no black patients. So I asked the guy, I said, look, why don't we have, I mean, we're seeing just as many uh, you know, young black children and infants and whatnot. Uh, why don't any of these patients get food out? She said, he said, the black patients wouldn't stick with the treatment. They so said they come two or three times and they wouldn't stick with the treatment. Uh, of course, that's changed dramatically. When you look in there now, it looks like an NAACP convention. But, um, <laughs> but so, so we don't have to worry anymore. But parents sometimes have to understand what Dr. Brown is talking about, Dr. Renee is talking about, so they can incorporate into their style when they enter the healthcare system. If you are just joining us, we are talking to Dr. Renee, Dr. Michael Lenore, and Dr. Brown 
with regards to allergies and asthma. And so we're talking about children primarily because that's when it first typically gets diagnosed. We're also talking about adults as well because uh, some of us can, can suffer from allergies throughout our lives. And so uh, let's talk about that just a little bit because I, I, there's a tendency to think that exercise can cause asthma or it can help asthma. So Dr. Renee, give us a definitive answer. Can exercise cause asthma or can exercise help you get rid of asthma? So exercise can help you make your, your lungs better, but there is exercise induced asthma attacks. So some people okay. when they actually, and which you can totally, you know, you can take care of the doctors will prescribe you something. You take your medicine before As matter of fact, I ran two five Ks, two 10 Ks and did a half marathon. I couldn't finish the mile in fifth grade. Okay. When you had to do that little physical test or whatever at the end right. of the school year, I couldn't finish it. So for the fact that I did that as an adult was amazing, but it was because I got smart. I would puff my inhaler before I started. And by the time I finished, I was, it didn't take me 30 minutes to catch my breath. I was like, oh, I, I can function. I'm okay. And so now I can run long periods of time and I'm okay. But um, it was, and it was funny. I training for those races had a pulmonary function test. And the doctor was like, your lungs have vastly improved. What are you doing? And I was like, oh, I've been doing this couch to 5K, couch to 10K. He goes, well, it's working. Keep doing that. So I sent the results to my mom and she immediately picked up the phone. I emailed her. She called me and said, Renee, you can't send other people's medical results over the internet. That's HIPAA. I go, mom, <laughs> those were my results. She said, oh, Renee, your lungs weren't like that when you were born. What did you do? And I said, it's this running thing, he said. And and I was running outside too. But thanks oh, to wow. the lovely allergist that I had, I had allergy shots as a kid. And now all of the things that I am allergic to outside, I had allergy shots. And so I'm okay. So I was running on the lakefront in Chicago, freshly, you know, mown grass, blow, you know, mown grass and everything. And I was fine. Ooh. But it's because of the fabulous physicians that were on my team that got me to where I actually I don't take daily meds anymore. I just carry my inhaler every day and that's all I need. But it's been about five years since I've taken Advair. So. Oh, wow. There are some associated things that people should realize. There are really two concepts of exercise induced asthma. One is the patient that tells me I have exercise induced asthma and really has that sometimes. That's a vagal mediated phenomenon that people get after exercise is over. But a lot of patients that I have with exercise uh, induced asthma just have poorly controlled, regular asthma manifested by exercise. And when we've lost patients tragically through the years, it's not been that very severe patient. It's been that patient with moderate uh, persistent asthma who was uh, engaged in a, an activity did not have an action plan, and before we could get them to the hospital, uh, something bad had happened. So those of you who have, quote, exercise-induced asthma, make certain, unlike I'm sure Dr. Renee was well-managed, uh, make sure you're well-managed, uh, because a lot of times you just got bad asthma that's manifested with the little exercise you do do. So we mentioned, uh, we've heard the word treatments uh, before. So Dr. Brown, what are some of the treatments that parents you know, or even adults can leverage in order to maintain kind of a healthier state with, with while living with asthma? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're talking about living with asthma, just like Dr. Renee is talking about and Dr. Lenore is talking about, you should be able to do anything, right? If you're well controlled, it should not limit you. You should be able to live in hot, humid, you know, community or cold air, right? You should be able to go out and run your couch to 5, 5K, right? Your kids should be able to, you know, do any of their sports if they really are well controlled. And it depends on where you are in your asthma spectrum, what you may need. And so everybody's asthma is not necessarily the same, right? And so there are some who are going to be on a rescue inhaler, a short acting medicine called albuterol, which is one of the most common, you know, relief medicines that we'll use immediately when somebody comes in, they're very short of breath, they're their lungs are tight, they're wheezing badly to really relax those muscles and help them get air in and out. 
And then sometimes kids actually need a steroid to either take by mouth or inhale to really calm that inflammation down in their lungs. And that works, of course, over time, not necessarily immediately. And there certainly are also combination medicines, right, where you're combining an inhaled steroid, sometimes with a longer acting you know, medicine that's going to relax those airways. But you're going to work with your PCP, with your pulmonologist, with your allergist, to figure out what exactly you need, because it depends on where you are in your asthma control to make sure that we get it controlled. We'll always use the lowest steroid dose that we you know, need to, right? Because um, our goal is to really treat you. And just like Dr. Renee was talking about, if you have persistent asthma and what we're doing is not working, you should see an allergist right? You mm -hmm. need to have a workup. So that is part of, you know, the formal recommendation. So don't be shy about asking for a pulmonary consult, for an allergy consult to make sure, because if you have specific flares, right, when the cat comes up and you're flaring, right, every single time you get exposed, we need to do something about that allergy, right? And it can't just be to use dust covers, right? That alone is not going to work for, for asthma and, al and allergies, right? So I think it's really important to have the education, know how your medicines work and know how to take them appropriately, right? So if you don't know how to use an inhaler, but it was prescribed to you, it's not gonna help if the medicine is not getting where it's supposed to. So also making sure that you really understand what it is that the medicine is supposed to do, how to take it, when to take it, and come back, ask questions, always bring your medicines to the visit with you so you can make sure that you guys are talking about the same things. And each time you leave, you should have a new asthma action plan with you, or if it's going to stay the same and you've got it, that's okay. But you want to make sure that you and your child, when they're age appropriate, really understand when to use their medicines, when not to, because when kids get into trouble, the thing that happens is that they will stop breathing, right? Mm. Kids' hearts can go for a really long time, but when they start to have trouble, that rate initially is very fast and then it starts to slow down and sometimes it's mistaken that their asthma is actually getting better and then they stop breathing so you want to be really careful and not wait until the last minute like dr lenora was saying to come in if that asthma is getting worse because a lot of times folks are like i'm going to come after work or maybe tomorrow or i don't want to miss school but come when they are having trouble, you need to be seen. Everyone should have a peak flow meter. Everyone should have a peak flow meter. You can't have an asthma action plan and not have a peak flow meter because what are you measuring? You have no idea. So just because you think everything's okay, it may not be okay. You could blow on the peak flow meter and you're blowing a 60. No, it's not okay. You you need to hurry up and get some get, get some attention. And your inhaler may not be that it may not work when you get down that low. So, and a lot of people don't have peak flow meters. They're like, what's that? And I have a I'm sitting here trying to figure out what a peak flow meter is. So I'm going to speak up for it. month is Allergy Asthma Awareness Month, and I'm going to do a show because I have lots of gadgets. I've got peak flow meters. I have <laughs> nebulizers. I have a spirometry that talks to my phone so I can do my own little pulmonary function test at home. Like, So I have all sorts of gadgets. But, um, but yeah, you got to have a peak flow meter. Dr. Nora, it looked like you wanted to say something there, no? No, I think that what's been said in the last 10 minutes is outstanding. I have nothing to add. Okay, all right. So where yeah, I can't you? add something. Well, yeah, I, got I don't know. I just want to make this, a couple of statements. One very quick thing. We don't, we have so many patients who use so many different kinds of treatments that we don't know about at home for asthma. And that's okay while you're messing around with mild and moderate. I, I'll give you another quick anecdote because of my age and stage, I'm allowed to do that instead of science. But anyway, I had a very bad asthma when I was a kid. Uh, one of the things that got me interested in this. And I, every sum, summer, I was siphoned off to the state of Tennessee. Not just to Tennessee, but to the Smoky Mountains 
where my grandmother mm -hmm. uh, lived. And so I had asthma. So I did everything I could, everything I could to get home. Wrote letters, which she never mailed. Sent out, you know, those pigeons. Uh, message in a bottle. I did everything. Try to get my grandmother uh, to send me home. And so when I had asthma attacks, I was just exaggerated. I was breathing hard. I was rolling over. And I'll go quickly through it. But my grandmother would take something out called Green Mountain Asthma Powder. And she would put it in and she would burn it. And everybody in the room relaxed. And Green Mountain Asthma Powder turned out to be 100% pure cannabis grown in the Smoky Mountains. And so was <laughs> Green Mountain Asthma Powder. But the point I'm trying to make is that we do have lots of families who are doing lots of things we don't know about. So it is important to request and ask those questions that might make those things, um, those issues uh, manifest. Yeah, I, I, I've already made a mental note that I'm calling my mama right after this uh, panel because I we got she got some explaining to do um, because you know <laughs> it was more of a wait and see type of approach <laughs> with it. And I, didn't, and I didn't learn about my, my allergies. Uh, I'll, I'll call her. I'll tell her. I'm not saying that I wouldn't say to her. I would, I would tell her. It's like, like <laughs> literally, I'm thinking about like all the, the you know. I learned I had allergies uh, as an adult, and it was just I started playing sports, you know, and uh, I realized I, I would realize when I would cut grass as a kid, I would always get itchy and wheezy every time. Uh, and I was like, I hate it. And that's why, that's part of the reason why I don't, I don't do yard work now is because I'm like, if I can pay somebody to do it, I'm gonna, cause that, that whole process as a child was just so annoying to me. I love to play sports, but every time we'd play football with the kids and it was like, my skin would start itching and I'd have to go through this whole, I'd have to take a bath and really, and I, di I didn't know what it was. And we never went to, we only went for that annual physical that you needed to be able to play sports, but we never did the follow-up work and it was just, um, and it was it was very seasonal. It would always happen in the spring and the summer, uh, primarily when in colder months it didn't happen. So I uh, never understood it. And I think I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm speaking what a lot of people are experiencing or what they're doing right now. So that's why we're doing this program here as part of Minority Health Month to get people to recognize that there is an outlet. There are treatments available for you or for your children so they don't have to suffer in silence or or really have those unplanned random emergency room visits when it's something that could be really, really treatable. So, you know, there, there's a great question here um, from Kazan. They're asking what's a test they can take to determine what makes their eyes red and swell when I'm outside or inside. I know it's airborne. It could be dust, pollen, etc. I'm using Pataday but my optometrist told me to address it with an allergist. So basically that was a long way of saying their eyes are getting red. Should they be going to an allergist because it's not being treated well by their optometrist? Because it's hard to determine. How did they get to the optometrist in the first place for this problem? But you know, I think that, uh, that the yeah, primary care doctor is the first line of defense situation like this. In fact, the individual is in the first line of defense because many of those products that I can remember were only uh, available through my permission with my prescription pad are now just across the counter. A lot mm -hmm. of good eye drops, a lot of good antihistamines. So the first thing you do is you defend yourself and, uh, and know that you run, this happens every year. What makes you think it's not going to happen this year? It is. And after every year it happens, you say, I'm going to do something about it. You never do. But the first thing you could do is to go get some medications. Uh, they got antihistamines, eye drops, nasal sprays, which used to be by prescription. And then you go to your primary care doctor. And then if it's incapacitating you and interfering with your quality of life, uh, then you either demand or ask to go to an allergist. And I think that's the time to do it. <laughs> I like that strong response there. Um, there's, a, there's another question here uh, from Mackie. And uh, they're, they're saying they're going through food allergies. They stopped going to uh, the, the allergies that they were seeing because he said there was no such thing as food allergies, which that, that's problematic in and of itself. But I break out in hives when I eat a lot of foods. So I mostly eat 
salad. So Dr. Renee, I, I, it's something that's near and dear to you. Should this person go see another allergist and start maybe trying to get a regimen to where they can expand their food offerings? Because salads are great. I know, hey, salads are great. But if I was only like resigned to eating salads in my life, I think I would have some problems with that. So how could this person be helped uh, so they don't get stuck with salads the rest of their lives? I, you know, we say it here all the time. You don't have to be married to these physicians. So go find another doctor because that one wasn't taking, you know, that's what second and third opinions are for. Go find another doctor because um, I'll tell you a little secret. I don't eat salads. <laughs> I lost 70 pounds and haven't had a salad yet. But um, so I'm miserable because I don't know what I eat. That's the seven, that's the seven o'clock show, by the way. Right. You know, lose, yeah, lose the weight with yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so don't, um, so go see another doctor. And, you know, there is something obviously that is causing you to, you know, break out in hives. So maybe it's, it might be just one particular food. It might be the way it's prepared. It might be the pesticide that was, you know, if it was a fruit or something, it was the pesticide that was put on the plants or whatever. Please go see another doctor. And so you can figure out exactly what it is you are allergic to because, there's no reason. I mean, unless you like eating salads all the time, there's no reason to be miserable like that. And just from a mental health standpoint, think about what that feels like, you know, because I understand you have restricted your diet to the point where you, you said, okay, salads are the only thing that's safe for me. Um, that Mentally, that's got to be tough, right, to understand. And so when we're talking about physical health, that's what allergies and, 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 and asthma are, there's always a mental health component of that. And so how restricting is that for you to understand and, not, and, and look at a plate of food and be worried about whether or not I'm going to break out in hives if I eat this food? That's got to be tough for you. And so that could cause you to avoid some activities like parties and potlucks and different, you know, going out. And so now it's really impacting your social and occupational functioning. So from a mental health standpoint, I would encourage you to go find out what the root is, find out what, what you're really allergic to. It'd be something that's a common seasoning that's in food. And so that's why you're you're eating a, a multitude of things that are causing you to have hives because that same seasoning is used in, in multiple things and that could be problematic. And so really for your own peace of mind and mental health, I would say, please go see an allergist and get to, get to the root of that. All right, here's a good, good question from Ray J. Uh, not, not that Ray J, uh, I'm sure, but another, another Ray J. Um, what, are, what are the chances that a child outgrows asthma and allergies? Dr. Brown, help us understand what are the chances that a child outgrows asthma and allergies? You know, it's different for food allergies and then, you know, kind of asthma, right? So a lot of times you can get to a point like Dr. Renee where she has asthma, but it's very well controlled. Um, or if folks haven't had an exacerbation in a really long time and they think that they've completely outgrown it. And then all of a sudden something happens and they have a flare and then do you have your rescue inhaler? So um, it's not one of those things that, you know, we expect kids to necessarily outgrow um, asthma, but certainly there are a lot of food allergies that can actually dissipate as kids get older. Um, and so we can routinely, you know, test and we certainly wouldn't test more than once a year but we can test and see, you know, are your food allergies getting better? You know, are we able to then, you know, do some, you know, challenges, those kinds of things, of course, in the office observed um, and making sure that you have access to emergency treatment, but certainly is not always going to be lifelong. But first we need to know, you know, what you have. So I'll run through my list. I'm allergic to eggs, nuts, wheat rye barley, citrus fruits, and seafood. Seafood's the only one I can't, I can't smell seafood cooking and I'll get sick. So the eggs, I can eat eggs baked in things, but when I was younger, I couldn't have eggs in anything. So that got better. And then um, I, there's a chart, it's in my book too, of all the things my mom gave the preschool this chart and said, Renee can eat, Renee can't eat. And on that chart of can't eat was Ritz crackers and saltines. I happen to like carbs and Ritz and saltines are my best friends. So I would have just, I was like, what? No way. Also, you can't eat um, the black crackers? You couldn't eat the black crackers? You know, we love some saltines and some Ritz. Come on now. And then also Boy. I was allergic to um, 
I was allergic to, it was a lot of fruits besides citrus fruits, but now citrus fruits is like, I don't do oranges and grapefruit and stuff, but I can eat apples and pears and, um, but, uh, the, um, the crackers thing really blew me away. And then there was, um, some cereals and then, oh, I still don't eat lasagna because I, there was this whole tomato thing. And so now I can do like, I eat pizza. Um, I couldn't eat, drink milk, cow's milk mm -hmm. that is. And in college, my mom said, I think you'll be okay with skim milk. And I was, and now because I am a more educated human being, I no longer drink cow's milk. I only drink oat milk. <laughs> I literally went off of it for a long time. And when I went and drank it, I immediately started. <clears throat> <clears throat> mm. And I was like, what's that? I haven't done it in so long. I didn't know what it was. I was like, oh, it's the milk. I was like, I just had mm. a glass. And so <laughs> I, I was like, it's think... not worth it. I don't like having to do that. And I didn't realize that I'd stopped because I think my whole life I did that. So. I was like, yeah, I, think okay. I think it's important to recognize, though. I've had patients, many patients who've had food allergy before, of course, oral immunotherapy was uh, instituted. Uh, and even to this day, I have some patients who leave here and they go to Eastern Europe because they do a better job of the diagnostics of food allergy. And they go and they come, and they go down the Danube and they come back to the office. And the treatment is always first, don't eat the food. That's the first treatment. I mean, and I think a lot of parents go, go too too far in not understanding what's going on with their children. You ask them to keep a job. When I see patients say, with a carrier with, with any kind of a food-related issue, uh, and usually they don't have a clear-cut idea it's exactly which food, I say, you keep a journal for a month, then you come back here, and then we may be able to determine and define what... Uh, what you're allergic to, but, and I said your history, and I think this is important when you deal in allergy, that the patient's history, your history to those that are looking at you, has more validation than any of the testing that I can do. Mm. Remember, that is, like Dr. Brown said, you can't, you don't test for everything just because, no, <laughs> it's the history. That's why Dr. Lenore would talk to the parent and be like, so this, this, and this, because those allergy tests will really have you completely not eating anything. Right. Because there's a yeah. lot of false positives that can happen. So that's why it's so important. And everyone's like, you're not still allergic. I said, I've had enough accidental mishaps that I've noticed that I must still be allergic. Like the time that eggs, egg whites were on my shirt and I didn't know. But all of a sudden I was itching. And then I heard, I call it my inner whistle. I heard myself wheezing and was like, why is my inner whistle? What's on my and I looked at my shirt and I go, oh, my God, I had bought eggs. And when I carried them, I didn't know one was cracked till I went and opened the carton and was like, oh. and this was in med school. And I was like, Lord, I'm about to kill myself and not even know it. <laughs> why, so, did you, why did you go buy the eggs? I told you I can eat them baked in things. And you know you got to put your eggs in your jiffy. Dr. Lenore, now you know. I have, have my egg in my jiffy. You're the last person I sent for eggs. <laughs> but you know what? That's smart because because I don't buy them. That's why I didn't check the carton. I was my mother goes, you didn't check the carton before you left the grocery store. Yeah, no. You don't know so you're to open the egg and eggs and eggs. You're supposed to twist them a little bit too. <laughs> had no you're supposed idea. to twist them a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I made a pound cake the other day. I had my sister crack all the eggs. I was like, you cracked the eight eggs. I send you for the egg whites. <laughs> in, the, in the little carton, exactly. <laughs> and I think a good point too, you know, what Dr. Renee has experienced in her life, you know, we see a lot of families who are just terrified, like kids, they can't go to birthday parties, they're very restricted, those kinds of things. But even a two-year-old, right, can say no egg, right? And when they get developmentally appropriately, no thank you, right? I have to ask my mommy, I'm allergic to eggs, right? So you want to train your kids. As soon as you find out that they have an allergy, you want to train them, right? If somebody's offering you a cookie, right? Because a lot of times kids, because it's an adult, right? Or somebody older or somebody who's more authoritative, right? Mm -hmm. That they know that they can say no. They can put two words together, write it too. So you really want to teach them that and that they have to ask first. And a lot of times that just helps, you know, kind of alleviate for the parents, but always staying vigilant.
vigilant in exactly what her mom said too about making sure that the parents know at, at their house and those, those kinds of things that you, you're, you're prepared for those. But well, I asked my mom, I said, how, cause my list was so long. I asked her, how did I know? And she said, well, you would say, um, can I have this? And I'd say, no, you're allergic. And so in the book, it talks about how over time, I didn't know what allergic meant, obviously, at that young age. But then over time, I figured out what it meant. But right. I also knew growing up that I knew the list of things I was long. And I knew I knew no adults, even if she's my grandma, even if she's my auntie. I knew they didn't know the list, but I knew. So therefore, nobody was ever going to kill me because I knew what I could and couldn't eat. And I also, I'd ask questions if you were giving me something I couldn't identify. I'm like, what is that? No, I can't mm -hmm. eat that. Or what's in it, you know? So my my lot, even at 46 now, if I don't want to ask questions, I just don't eat. It's just real simple. Because <laughs> if you go to a restaurant and they got all these fancy sauces and all this stuff, either you just don't, you get it plain or you just don't eat. And I'm okay with that. Like I said, 46 years into this, I'm good. Like I know better, I'm okay. <laughs> I don't like being sick, so I'm okay. But it was amazing how I read in these groups, Dr. Brown, which is another reason why I wrote the first book, parents weren't telling the children what they were allergic to and sending them to school. Now, oh, if I was the teacher, I would be terrified. <laughs> but so I'm responsible and the kid doesn't know. And, you know, I've got more than one kid in the class. But there was parents that literally were like, well, we don't want Johnny to feel like he's different. So we're just not telling him. It begs the question whether they like the child in the first place. No, touchdown. <laughs> I was like, you have got to be out of your good mind. That's insane. That, that's, play a Russian roulette with your, that's play a Russian roulette with your child, particularly when you, you got Or the other way around. The kid knows, but they don't tell the school or the teacher. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or they don't even have epi at school, right? They don't right. have their their epi orders for school, right? So, and every year you have to get a new order, right? And it has to be signed by us and you as the parent. And then we have to sign something else to say that they can actually carry their rescue inhaler with them or carry their epi pen, you know, inhaler with them. So make sure that you get all of that done and don't be shy about asking for it. And you know, when I was in school, I had to go to the nurse's office to take my medicine. I didn't, I didn't carry it because I, I had to take something during the day I had to take. And I, you know, of course I had an albuterol or prevental back in prevental back in the day. And um, I, it was in the nurse's office. And actually my book takes place at my elementary school, which is still a functioning elementary school. So I read my book there in March during literacy, literacy month. Of course, they've done some renovations, but it's still, there was the nurse's office. And, you know, it, was really, <laughs> it was really cool to be back there. And, and the kids were all so surprised because their school was in the book. And you went here? Oh, my God. And yeah, so it was really cool. <laughs> I love that. And certainly, you know, for parents, one thing to advocate in your community is to make sure that your school has an EpiPen, right? So what if somebody mm -hmm. has their allergic reaction for the first time at school, right? Um, so, you know, that AED and that EpiPen should go right yeah. next to each other. So make sure that your school has it and has multiple. One of the most oh. effective systems that I've seen across the country is in the state of Missouri. In St. Louis, what happens is the nurse, right, uh, New Jersey, I'm sorry, the nurse writes something to the doctor, which the doctor has to sign uh, and send back to the nurse. It's not optional. It's mandatory if you're going to take care of children uh, in, the, I guess, New Jersey. So the nurse sends something, and the doctor has to go through it and send it back to her. Uh, and so that's part of the whole process. And that seems to have done a lot to reduce some of the unnecessary issues around asthma in schools. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to have this conversation continue on, but we are getting close to the top of the hour and we've got our next panel to get to. So uh, if you're still watching us, thank you for joining it. Uh, Dr. Nay put a link to her books uh, in the comments. So I know Tina, you asked for it. So there you got it. So go to askdrrenee.info slash books and you can get uh, her books, uh, you can order the books sent right to you um, and then send them to Dr. Renee and she'll give you a special message to sign it. <laughs> Boy, that, that, I'm going to write, write my book. 
I'm going to write me a book before next time we do this panel. So we'll be a bestseller. It'll be a bestseller. <laughs> but I want to say, just say, say thank you. And, and, and there was a quick question about uh, eating. They said they don't know if they have any food allergies, but when they eat certain foods, their stomach gets upset. I, that might be more of an internal medicine type situation. Just, you know, every food doesn't agree with you, right? And so that might not be an allergy. That just may be something that just doesn't agree with you. Like some of us, as we get older, you know, that milk thing, that lactose, lactose is serious. So, you know, the milkshakes, you got to put them down, please. Okay. All right. So we don't want to just be hurting people for no reason because you want that milkshake. Don't do it. So I want to say thank you to my guests, that's Dr. Lador, Dr. Brown, Dr. Rene. Thank you so much. This is a great way to kick off the Minority Health Summit. This is the first panel. This is one of five that we have today. So our next panel is really going to be about, uh, in the spirit of the escape zone, who do you run to? And it's about how and when to disclose a mental illness. So that's either to your partner, to your loved one, to your employer, how and when should you do it. So please, please, please stick around for that. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And we look forward to you staying with us the rest of the day on our Minority Health Summit, second annual Minority Health Summit. Thank you so much. Get an allergist, get a, get a, a pul pulmonary specialist, go see Dr. Brown. If you're here in the Atlanta area, you got some kids, go see Dr. Brown. She's fantastic. We'll see y'all next time. We'll see y'all at the top of the hour here on blackdoctor.org.